Okay. Okay. We ready? Hi, uh, I'd like to welcome you all and thanks for coming to our second in the series of uh, distinguished uh, chief economist um, invited lectures uh, here at the FCC. And today we're very lucky to um, have Paul Milgram uh, and I'll talk about uh, his background in a second. First I wanted to mention um, that this is part of um, the chairman's ongoing um, excellence in economics program uh, to try and improve and uh, keep up to date and current um, the economic analysis that's done at the commission. And I think that this lecture series and today's lecture in particular um, will help further those goals because of the uh, extensive experience Paul's had working with the commission. Um, so today's talk um, is titled Auctions and Matching. Um, the new science of, of market design, uh, an area close and dear to many of our hearts. Uh, so Paul, as we know, is the uh, Shirley R. and Leonard uh, W. Ellie uh, Junior Professor um, in Humanities and Social Sciences at Stanford. And Paul has had a long and illustrious history in the areas of uh, market design, auction theory, um, even um, accounting and economic history, many other areas. Uh, but I thought I'd just mention a couple of his papers that are uh, my favorites before we get onto, uh, onto today's topic. Um, so everybody here in the audience at some stage should have um, read, I think, um, the good news, bad news paper on representation of information in economics. This is a very elegant and simple paper which really, I think, played a pivotal role in uh, economists adopting the Bayesian framework and the way that we think about um, information and asymmetries of information. Uh, very elegantly laid out the tools, um, I think played an essential role in the, in the Bayesian revolution in game theory that happened in the early 80s. Um, later on, uh, there was a, another seminal paper which was tremendously important to us and our work here, uh, the Milgram and Weber paper on auctions uh, with affiliated information. Uh, which played a key role um, in laying the underpinnings for our development of the auction process that we had here, um, the simultaneous ascending uh, multiple round auction. And uh, the foundations in that paper later became known um, as the linkage principle, which is generally recognized as one of the key principles in auction design and, and mechanism design um, generally. Uh, so a lot of the pivotal um, work uh, uh, has been has been laid by Paul and his co-authors over the years uh, in terms of the real world problems that we have to tackle. And I think it's uh, tremendously valuable when somebody with that theoretical background then becomes interested in the real world nitty gritty policy issues which we here face. And uh, that's exactly what happened um, going back to our infamous fifth report and order um, on auction design when uh, the FCC solicited proposals for how to design a mechanism when we started to uh, auction spectrum off rather than allocating it through beauty contests, comparative hearings, um, and lotteries. And uh, the result, as they say, is history. And history soon to be chronicled in his uh, forthcoming book, um, Putting Auction Theory to Work, in which the FCC plays a pivotal role and even has an appearance on the cover, so I hear. <laughs> so um, we're all looking forward to seeing um, uh, that come out, um, and no doubt. Uh, the pictures of the glossy uh, pictures of Evan on on the book jacket. So here, I'll hand it over to Paul. Thank you, Simon. Well, it's a pleasure to be. Uh, where's the projector? There it is. I don't want to stand in front. It's a pleasure to be uh, back here today um, to get a chance to uh, talk to you. I know at least a handful of people in the audience. Uh, some of you for many years, including uh, Evan, at this point. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me uh, launch into what this is going to be about. Um, I'm going to have three sections, uh, not all equal in size, as you'll see as I go through. But there will be three main sections that I've, uh, I've conceived the talk. Um, I want to talk about the auction design in general and why there are uh, many ways to fail. I I'm going to uh, tell you about auctions that I have some experience with in, in well, one way or another that have one or another design flaw that led to uh, very bad outcomes. And uh, I'll explain to you um, uh, how a number of auctions have managed to fail. Uh, then talk about some recent successful designs. And, and, find, uh, and along the way, hopefully, uh, telling you about some, is this microphone working? I can't tell. 
Okay. Yep. Um, and then uh, along the way, hopefully telling you something about what we've learned about uh, auction design and, and, uh, and how to design auctions for the kinds of complicated problems like those that the FCC uh, has faced. And then uh, to tell you a little bit more about where research and market design is going, summing up uh, at the end. So in my section on many ways to fail, I'm going to uh, take a quick run through uh, a number of uh, real life auctions that have managed to fail uh, more or less spectacularly. Um, the, um, I'm going to tell you about uh, the, uh, well, I'll start soon with the Cook County auction. Cook County, every year, uh, sells the right to collect delinquent taxes. If you're, uh, if you're in Cook County, a lot of counties do this, actually. If you're late on your property taxes more than a couple of years, uh, Cook County allows uh, buyers to buy back those, uh, to pay the taxes on your behalf add a penalty and go collect. And we'll talk about the auction that organizes that. Um, the second example is from a Mexican uh, road contract where uh, uh, the uh, government of Mexico was uh, procuring bids uh, to, uh, to build a road in two main segments. And we'll see um, exactly what they did uh, uh, in that case. Um, I think probably the spectrum auction examples are best known to some of you. The, uh, there's the Germany, uh, Germany's 1999 uh, spectrum auction uh, that facilitated uh, a collusive looking outcome between Mansmann and, and T-Mobile. Um, you, you can't these days give an auction talk without at least mentioning the California electricity markets, uh, which California was unlucky in a lot of ways, as many commentators have pointed out, the, the, uh, the conditions uh, there were many things wrong with the way the California electricity market was set up, but some of the mistakes were also auction design mistakes, and uh, I will at least mention um, uh, some of that. And then the last uh, auction example will be Netherlands' uh, 1998 spectrum auction example. The reason I, I've been including that one is that one's going to turn out to be relevant to our thinking about package bidding. Why do we think package bidding matters? The commission has been investigating this. And uh, it'll give us some real life experience showing us why, uh, why package bidding might make a difference. Now, until recently, the um, different kinds of market designs, auction markets and matching markets, were regarded as completely separate animals. Um, that is no longer my view of this. And so I'm going to also lead you through some examples about, the, uh, about matching markets. And I'm going to try along the way to explain to you how these markets are connected to auction markets. The successful uh, uh, matching markets also involve bidding processes. So I'm going to talk about uh, British medical matches. This is a particularly nice example in terms of establishing that uh, auction design matters because uh, Britain has several medical matches. Some of them have succeeded and others have failed. And we can talk about the differences between the ones that have succeeded and the ones that have failed. Um, the psychology, uh, the way uh, recent psychology graduates are matched to postdocs and internships was changed in 1999. Uh, it was changed in a way that allows proxy bidding, basically. And since proxy bidding is another one of the issues that's on the agenda at the FCC, I want to explain to you uh, about the failures of the uh, postdoc, uh, psychology postdoc match prior to 1999 and what the, uh, what the changes were. Um, in New York City is... Uh, Students apply every year to high school in New York City. Some of you may have read in the New York Times this year they had a disaster in the match of, of students to high schools when hundreds of students were left without, without being matched. Recent graduates from junior high had not been matched to any high school. There were, uh, uh, they'd applied to a bunch of high schools. There's an application process for the specialized schools. Some of the students got turned down everywhere they applied, and they were, there were students not matched to high schools. It's a very bad uh, market design and a very bad outcome. And uh, Joel Klein, the, the commissioner of schools in New York, has uh, recently ad uh, adopted, or I'm sorry, has not yet adopted. They are designing, they're in the process of, of adopting a new mechanism that is supposed to be in use by this year for, the, uh, for 2004 when students will be matched to schools. It's a bidding process with a proxy bidder. Um, and I'll tell you about uh, uh, that one as well. And then, um, just to give you the idea that this isn't all about money, the last couple of things are not about money, there's also some work being done now. Um, 
it's, it's so far just scholarly work, I hope this turns itself soon into practical work, about improving the design of the kidney exchange. Uh, there are a lot of people who die on the waiting lists waiting for uh, cadaver kidneys that are, uh, that are suitable matches for them. And uh, improvements in the way this matching market works out, and this is also a bidding-like market, improving the way that this works out will save lives. This is a, a big deal, and, and uh, uh, there are people making serious attempts to make improvements on the market design. Okay, with that introduction, let me launch into the first example. This is um, Cook County. Uh, there are things like this that go on uh, all around the United States, but in Cook County, about 15,000 um, property owners a year are late on their um, taxes, at least two years late. And uh, you're laughing over there with that. Presumably, Washington doesn't do a lot better. Well, uh, anyway. The, uh, the, there are about 15,000 people a year who are at least two years late on their taxes, and Cook County annually conducts an auction where they sell the rights to um, collect overdue, uh, to, uh, to pay the overdue taxes and collect a penalty. And um, I want to tell you about this auction. It shows you how, the, I'm starting with this because this is a really low-tech auction. Uh, you can't imagine a lower-tech auction. The county auctioneer sits, there are videotapes of this. This is, uh, I know about this because of a lawsuit. Um, so I've, I've, I've watched this auction on videotape. It's very simple. The auctioneer sits in the front of, uh, in, in the front of a room, the, um, reads off a property number. There are bidders in the back of the room who have investigated property by property. They've investigated the condition of this property, whether the taxes are likely to be collectible. Um, they don't want to take on ownership of a property that has an environmental problem, for example. You, you don't want to buy a property like that. Uh, since the property also comes with obligations. So um, they, then uh, the bidders uh, start shouting bids, and it's a completely oral outcry auction. The bids are stated in percentage. It's a descending oral outcry auction. The uh, reservation bid is 18%, which means that you get to add a penalty of 18% to the overdue taxes uh, if you win at a price of 18%. And uh, if the property owner then pays, you collect the taxes plus 18%. And uh, whatever the winning rate is, is a penalty you get to add every six months. So it, uh, the penalties uh, climb rapidly, especially if they're a large number. So the opening bids are 18%. Somebody shouts 17, 16, 15 integer whole percent uh, decrements until there's a low bidder. And the item is uh, assigned to the winning bidder for whatever the percentage is, uh, let's say 5%. Now. Uh, there are some, as in every auction, one of the things you learn when you are engaged in auction design, every auction involves subtleties. You always have to know the details. And one of the first things that will surprise you if you don't know the details and looked at the auctions uh, prior to 1998, for example, if you looked in 1997, the auction for taxes that were overdue from 1995, uh, you would discover that 80% of the property sold for a penalty rate of 0%. And that might puzzle you. Uh, until you learn the rules, which say that if you pay the overdue taxes one year, okay, and if the guy is late again the next year, then you are entitled to pay the overdue taxes the next year, and you get a standard penalty rate of 12% on those. Most people who are late once are late more than once. Uh, so the, and 12% is a pretty good rate on, uh, on a well-valued property. So uh, bidders will... Um, well, in 80% of the cases, in the year before 1998, in the 1997 auction, the winning bid was 0%. The litigation arose because the next year there was a complete reversal. Essentially, 80% of the properties sold for the maximum penalty rate of 18%. Um, how did that happen? Okay, well, let me look at the details matter. The de in this case, it's a tiny detail. It's the tie-breaking rule. The rules of this auction specified, unlike a standard oral auction, in which um, several people uh, shout 18%, I might, if Evan and Simon shout 18%, I might say, I have 18% uh, from Simon, will somebody give me 17%? That's not the way they did it in Cook County. If uh, Evan and Simon both simultaneously shouted 18%, the auctioneer remains silent. If there, nobody says 17%, he says, sold, and basically tosses a mental coin says to Evan for 18%. That's it. Other than that, this is a completely standard auction. The only difference is the way you break ties. 
the auctioneer can't tell who went first, and those two guys shouted 18% at the same time, picks a winner at random. That detail is critical, okay? Why is that detail critical? Imagine the situation that Simon and Evan are in when they have both shouted 18%. They know they're in a tie approximately there. They each have a 50% chance of winning. What can they do? Well, Evan might think, gee, I could bid 17%, have a better chance of winning, but then Simon might bid 16. He might drive me, I, you know, I still probably only have a 50% chance of winning, and maybe I'll win for a price of 4%. If I keep my mouth shut, I have that same 50% chance of winning for 18%. So it's not in their interest anymore to continue to lower the price. This is a tiny detail. If, if the auctioneer merely said, Simon is the high bidder at 18%, then the, the calculation would change entirely. Evan would be forced to bid 17% for this uh, um, to have any chance of winning at all. That detail makes a huge difference to the strategy. Okay? Now, how do we know? You might say, well, that's a pretty story, but you know, maybe something else was going on. Maybe the bidders were really just colluding. So the, the, the Cook County case is beautiful because of uh, what happened. There were 15,000 properties for sale. This auction went on for weeks. And after the uh, first thousand or two properties had been sold essentially all at 18 percent, the auction, the county auctioneer, being a good government servant, uh, thought this is a terrible idea. This is not working out the way I expected. And he announced a change in the rules. He said, um, henceforth, if there's a tie at the opening bid for any price other than zero, I'm simply going to withdraw this property and we won't sell it for collection. That rule change, the result was an immediate drop in prices somewhere to the 10% range or below. Prices fell to 10%. And we started seeing some uh, lower prices. But a couple of the bidders who were pretty happy with the way things had been going went to the county court and said, this is a county auctioneer. He can't change the rules in the middle of the auction. The court issued a temporary restraining order, and the price is shot right back up to 18%. Okay? So uh, pretty clear evidence that the rules mattered and that this tiny rule, just the treatment of ties, could have a huge impact on the way the auction performed. Okay? Cook County. Whoops. Mexico. So this, this is another pretty one. This is one, I, I always suspect corruption when I look at auctions in, uh, outside, well, even in the developed world. I always suspect corruption when I look at auctions. But in the developing world, you really look at, uh, you expect corruption. Um, so there was a major road construction contract being let by a sealed bid auction. Um, the auction was going to be audited by a private accounting firm was audited, I should say, by a private accounting firm. Um, the sealed bids were taken. What happened? Well, the, the rules of the auction were as follows. So the government was going to construct this road in two sections. It wasn't sure if it was going to have enough funding for both sections. So it asked the bidders to specify three numbers, a price for section A alone, a price for section B alone, and a total price. And it was going to use the total price to determine the winner. Okay. You have to ask yourself why they asked for three numbers here when there are only two independent numbers. Well, what happened in the actual auction? In the actual auction, the winning bidder, the bidder who made the lowest A plus B bid, also submitted a number C that was less than A plus B. Okay? This is a non-conforming bid. It broke the rules of the auction. It had a number C less than A plus B. It's bid one. And the, um, the bidder said, hey, wait a minute, that was just uh, an arithmetic error. You can't charge me the price C. Obviously, I've specified these prices A and B. That's what I'm supposed to pay is A plus B. That was, the, that was lower than anybody else's A plus B. That's the winning bid. Okay, So that's a little shaky in its own right. But if you think a little more deeply about what may have been going on behind the scenes, well, just think about it. Suppose that you're the auctioneer. Suppose they hired me and I was corrupt. I hate to, don't, don't hypothesize that. Suppose they hired some very talented auction designer who was corrupt. And they, they approached that auction designer and said, you know, can you help us? We, we really want to support collusion in this auction. What could we do if we want to, so what we want to do is we've got a ring here of, of people. Uh, but, you know, there's some problems in cheating in sealed bid auctions sometimes. We want Evan to win this contract at a particular price, A plus B. But the, the, but the problem is that Simon might cheat on the agreement and undercut him. How can we prevent that from happening? 
say, well, let's get the government to design the auction like this. Instead of having them take two numbers, A and B, let's have them take three numbers, A, B, and C. We'll have Evan bid the price A plus B that he's supposed to win it at. It's a nice fat price with a good high profit margin for him. And then we'll have him bid a number C, which is a good bid less than A plus B, so that Simon won't be able to make a winning bid that undercuts him. Then we'll say that C was uh, an arithmetic error, and we'll have, uh, we'll have Evan withdraw that bid, and he'll be able to win at the price A plus B. Okay? Well, if you were trying to design uh, an auction with a collusive outcome, this would have been a pretty clever design. That's all I can say for sure. Um, you put your own stories on why the, what, what else might account for this set of, uh, of facts. Okay? So that's two different mistakes. Um, Here's a, here's a third one. This one is from uh, Germany, the 1999 Spectrum Auction. Um, I think a lot of you have probably heard about this one. There were uh, uh, 10 licenses for sale. Um, there were uh, several smaller bidders who were not expected to be effective competitors. Two large bidders, Manisman and T-Mobile. And they had a, a kind of simultaneous ascending auction. And uh, what did uh, management do? Management's behavior in this auction, given the rules, was brilliant. But uh, the rules uh, permitted such, uh, uh, such a uh, stratagem. What they did is they opened uh, the bidding with a jump bid to uh, 20 million marks for five licenses. This is in an auction with a 10% bid increment. And they bid 18.18 million marks for the other five licenses. Well, if you think code bidding is clear, as you've seen code bidding at the FCC, this is a pretty clear message to T-Mobile. So why don't you make that 10% increment on these 18.8 uh, $18 million dollar licenses? Then you'll pay $20 million for five licenses, and we'll pay $20 million for five licenses. Right? Well, uh, T-Mobile got the message. Given the 10% increment, they bid $20 million for five licenses, and that was the end of the auction, two rounds. OK? So um, you haven't made that mistake here anyway. Right? All right. As I said, um, you, you really can't talk about auctions and auctioneers without somebody asking about the California electricity markets. So um, let me talk about what the, the and, and I like to point out about the California electricity markets that this was not mostly about auction design. There were a number of problems with the way California structured its electricity markets. They had, uh, they had offered fixed long-term prices to electricity buyers, and they were buying short in the spot market. That has been, that's the same reason we had the SNL crisis, where there were long-term loans and short-term borrowing. It's the same reason we had the Asian financial crisis. I mean, anytime you, you, you patch this, this long and short-term stuff together, you're asking for trouble. They also had a, a run of bad luck. You may recall the, the, um, uh, in that period, the weather. Uh, created unusual demands on the electricity system, which drove electricity prices very high. There were some other problems. I can't quite recall what they all were. So they, there was a lot of bad luck involved. But in addition to the bad luck, there were also some terrible market design that anybody who had, if, if they'd paid any attention, as the FCC has been fortunate to do, if they paid any attention to a staff that could really look at and analyze the auction design, they would have seen some of these problems. So one of the problems was that there were two markets in, uh, for California electricity. There's the so-called day-ahead market and the same-day markets. And in the day-ahead market, which was used for setting the schedule for the day, they had uh, people uh, make bids to uh, supply and demand electricity at various nodes in the grid. And they, in accepting those um, in setting the schedule for the day, they did not check the feasibility of transmission constraints in the day ahead market. This is an amazing mistake. Uh, they didn't guarantee that the schedule that was planned for the day was feasible. So to give you one example, and by the way, when the schedule was infeasible, the system operator on the next day has to buy back the planned power shipments in order to make the schedule feasible. So one example was uh, there was a small town in the Sierras, and there's only one small power transmission line running up to the Sierras. And uh, one bidder uh, said that it wanted to deliver this huge amount of power, basically to Truckee, 
which is a small town uh, up in the Sierras, along the single transmission line there, an amount of power that way exceeded the capacity of the line, something like a factor of 10 exceeded the capacity of the line. And on the day when, uh, when you actually have to deliver the power, the, uh, the system operator then had to buy back that 90% of the transmission capacity at whatever price the, uh, was being demanded by the uh, guy who had scheduled the shipment. This is basically one of the techniques that Enron used. Um, to make huge profits off the um, off California electricity. So you schedule massive shipments along constrained lines, and uh, then you get yourself paid to cancel them. Right? This is not rocket science. And again, if you pay detail to if you pay detail attention to the market design, you don't run into problems like this. But there, you know, market design is often in in many respects is like engineering. You really have to get the details right, or you're or you're going to uh, get yourself in big trouble. OK. Now, this one isn't as bad, um, but this one is uh, indicative of the reason we were interested in package bidding. Um, a lot of the reasons that you hear when people describe interest in package bidding comes from the fact that, you know, from laboratory experiments or from stories that we tell, uh, it's nice to have some examples that are based on, you know, real spectrum auctions. And this is the Netherlands 1998 spectrum auction. Um, so a variant of a simultaneous ascending auction, ran for 137 rounds, raised uh, almost 2 billion guilders. And the, uh, what I'm reporting here are the prices that emerged. From the, there were 18 licenses for sale. I'm not going to describe their technical details. They differ in a lot of details. The, um, the main thing to keep in mind is that lots A and B, which were the largest lots uh, uh, being sold, were designed to have enough spectrum that the regulator believed they would support a new entrant into the market. Lots 1 through 16 were much smaller lots. Uh, they had less bandwidth. And uh, they were designed for um, uh, either to be add-ons to A and B or to be purchased by existing incumbents who needed to expand uh, their spectrum capacity. Okay. Now you'll notice that the prices that emerge from this auction, these prices are all normalized, so they're comparable. They're expressed in, uh, it's a price per unit of bandwidth, or per unit of uh, a measure of capacity that they use in the Netherlands. And you'll see that um, uh, lots A and B sold for 8 or 7.3 million guilders per band, whereas um, lots 1 through 16 sold for prices ranging from 2.9 to 3.6 uh, million guilders per band, much less. We're talking about spectrum that is, uh, oops, uh, the spectrum that's very much uh, the same quality, selling for, uh, selling for a much lower price. Well, how did that happen? You ask yourself, you might ask yourself, why wouldn't the new entrant say, gee, these prices are awfully high. Why don't I just buy, by the way, it turned out that about six or eight of these was equivalent to one of these. Why don't I just buy a half dozen of the smaller lots instead of bidding for the larger lot? It would provide me with the same capacity. And the answer is what we've come to call the exposure problem. That is, if you start buying, uh, trying to buy six or seven or eight of these little lots, uh, you might find yourself becoming the winning bidder on four of these lots as the price goes way up because of your extra demand. Four of the lots is not enough to, uh, to set up a um, uh, efficiently scaled telephone business, one that's uh, a viable business plan. And you find yourself in a situation where you, you either have to keep bidding for additional lots, driving up the price of all of them and paying too much, or else uh, drop out and leave yourself with a few lots that are unusable. Okay. So the New entrant bidders were afraid to try to assemble packages bidding on uh, for, to win a half dozen or eight of these. And they only bid, for the most part, on lots A and B. Lots A and B, with the extra demand of competition among the new entrants, ended up selling for a much higher price. Now, you might or might not be upset by the uh, allocation here. It depends uh, if you represented the incumbents. You might be very happy with the way it worked out. Um, but you might think that the pricing is unfair. You might wonder whether there's some alternative way to do it. And the, the kind of package auction designs that we're now talking about setting up for the FCC would allow bidders to bid for what they wanted. So a bidder who was looking at this 
and who was a new entrant, and seeing that the incumbents were paying only three or so uh, per band, uh, in a package auction setting would be able to say, I want to buy eight of these things at three. In fact, I'm willing to pay four. Um, I, and I'm going to offer a price of, uh, of four per band for a package of eight bands. And that bid would then be considered in its entirety. And these uh, uh, incumbent bidders, if they want to acquire the spectrum, would have to outbid the, uh, the four per band that's being offered by the uh, new entrant. So it creates the possibility for competition between uh, bidders who want only small amounts of spectrum and bidders who want large amounts of spectrum for bidders who have different uh, business plans in mind. I remember in, in yesterday's um, uh, workshop that we had here, uh, uh, Jerry Vaughn was talking about the, uh, the need to keep auctions simple in order to promote entry and competition. And that is certainly an important factor in, keeping, uh, in promoting entry and competition. But letting bidders bid for what they want is another thing that's important to promote both entry and competition. We didn't have the, the new entrants effectively entering or competing for these licenses, and that's why their prices were relatively low. Okay? We could have promoted that by allowing package bidding, which despite its additional complexity, makes it possible for a new group of bidders to uh, bid and compete on those licenses. Let's see. Okay. And now, am I, have I been clear so far about the auction examples? Let me turn to the matching examples. Um, I'm turning to matching because, again, if you'd asked me or anyone, I think, two or three years ago about uh, matching and auctions, we would have said they were completely different things. Most of the matching models, uh, most of the matching processes that people look at don't have money in them. Uh, you, for example, in, the, in a medical match, we have in the United States the National Resident Matching Program, uh, doctors name the hospitals that they'd prefer to be matched to. Hospitals make rank order lists of doctors. There's no negotiation over price, no competition about prices. And, uh, and a match is transacted. And that seemed, at the time, and may still seem to some of you, to be a very different process from an auction process. I want to try to convince you that all the matching processes that I'm talking about today are actually bidding processes. Um, and that there are lessons to be learned from them that we can use for thinking about auction design. Okay, so I have to tell you a little bit about their successes and failures of, of matches. Um, so I'm going to talk about the British medical match first. And this is uh, similar to, in the United States, we have residency programs. After you graduate medical school, uh, you spend some time as a resident to uh, qualify in a specialty. In England, before you can begin practicing it as a doctor, there is what they call a pre-registration program, a one-year program, where doctors are matched to hospitals to get practical experience uh, before they begin practicing as, as, uh, as doctors. Uh, in several areas of England, in the United States, we have one centralized match for the entire nation. In England, uh, it's different. There are a number of districts uh, which each have their own matching programs. and um, centralized matches have been tried. A bunch of them have failed. Uh, the matches in Birmingham, Newcastle, and Sheffield are no longer in use. Uh, they attempted to set up matching schemes to match doctors with hospitals. They did something that looks like this. What they did was not a bidding scheme. Right? What they did was they said, uh, doctors, rank your hospitals, uh, the, which, which program and which order you would like to have them, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, hospitals rank your doctors, and we're going to match doctors to hospitals like, like this. First, we're going to go and see if there are any first choice matches. Uh, some hospital who uh, likes some doctor first, and that doctor likes that hospital first, that's a match. We'll knock that one off. Then we'll see if there's any first and second choice matches. Uh, some doctor uh, likes some hospital first, and the hospital likes that doctor second. We've already taken care of the uh, first choice matches. We'll make that match. And then any, that was a one to two match, and then we do all the two to one matches, and then the one to three matches, and then the three to one matches, and then the two to two matches. And the order in which they do them is uh, based on, they multiply the ranks. So uh, the one to three match comes first because one times three is three. You do that before the two to two match because two times two is four. So they created a, a priority matching scheme where there was a priority for the matches, and they just went down the list 
and uh, match the doctors and the hospitals accordingly. Okay? That was one of the matches. That's no longer in use. What's wrong with it? Well, what's wrong with it is it leads to some bad matches sometimes. For example, um, you could very well imagine that here I am, I'm ranked to uh, my 15th choice hospital because that hospital ranks me first. And our priority is 15. My fourth ranked hospital ranks me fourth. Okay? So that uh, between us, we're, our number is 16, so I'm being forced to my 15th ranked hospital. But that fourth ranked hospital is being matched with somebody else that it doesn't especially doesn't like as much as it likes me, and I like them better. So I break the contract that's been suggested here, or I say, oops, my circumstances have changed. Um, I can't move to that area anymore. I'm going to go to this, um, this other hospital. So these, these uh, matches didn't stand up. Okay? A whole bunch of matches like these that did not stand up. Which matches did stand up? Well, Edinburgh and Cardiff had matches that stand up that are still in use. Okay? How did the Edinburgh and Cardiff matches work? They were bidding processes. Right? They worked like this. The, um, these are bidding processes without money. Right? They work like this. A doctor says to a hospital, you are my first choice. Okay, remember, let me remind you how, what I mean by a bidding process. I have this funny look from Pepper over here. What's a bidding process without money? So uh, how does any, any an ordinary auction for a single item work? What happens is uh, I make a bid for that item. If it's the best bid that the seller has, he holds on to that bid. Uh, somebody else makes a better bid, re then rejects that bid and takes the better one, holds on to that, and looks and sees if he's going to get a better one. It's a sequential process in which one side is evaluating offers and holds on to the best offer it's gotten so far. Okay? That is the process that was used in Edinburgh and Cardiff. Doctor uh, says, um, you're my first choice hospital pepper. I, I'm applying to you. Um, and you say, well, that's my best offer so far. I'm going to hold on. Then you get an offer from Simon over here. And you say, sorry, Milgram, I, I like Simon better. Um, I'm going to reject your offer and take Simon's offer. So it's now my, I don't, I'm not a winning bidder anymore, so to speak. It's my turn to bid again. Um, I can't make another bid to you. There's no prices involved. So I make an offer to Evan as my second choice hospital. And uh, the process proceeds just like a simultaneous ascending auction, except that um, I don't get to vary the price. There's only one price it's with a very large bid increment, if you will. Uh, <laughs> So large that nobody would ever choose to make the to make the uh, um, that other bid. Okay, it's really the same process as uh, these processes are really the same process as the uh, sending auction process. Okay. There we go. Okay. Now, um, I want to talk to you about proxy bidding. This is another one of the issues that's on the agenda. Uh, for improvements in the auction procedures at the FCC. And I've already explained to you how, um, how bidding works. The clinical psychology match is similar to the medical match. In clinical psychology, before 1999, this was not an automated process. There was a day called match day. Uh, the last, they went through a whole series of different processes they tried. The last thing they tried, they rented out a hotel. They had people, uh, students who were uh, possibly to be matched in, in this hotel room, they, uh, in their hotel rooms or possibly at their home numbers. They had the, uh, uh, the programs that were seeking postdocs or, um, uh, or internships or interns to, uh, on that day, they got to make a telephone call. I, I call uh, uh, Pepper and I say, uh, you know, Pepper, uh, you had a great interview here. We're very happy with you. I'd really like to offer you an internship. Um, and Pepper, who may or may not already have received previous offers, will either say, well, I'm sorry, but you know, I've already accepted. A, I'm holding a, a position that I prefer. Or else will say, well, that's interesting. Um, I'd like to hold on to your offer for a while. Okay? And so and we're going to hear what is a simultaneous ascending auction again, or a simultaneous ascending matching procedure. I hang up the phone, and now I know that Pepper's holding one of my positions. I've got three to offer. I make two other telephone calls, and uh, eventually I've got three offers being held. And a little while later, Pepper gets a, a better offer from someone else, and um, he calls me back and says, um, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, I have gotten an offer that I prefer. I have to reject your offer. Okay? So it's offers and acceptances. Each guy, you know, 
you make an offer, you hold on to the best one you have. When you reject an offer, if I have, I still want more, I, I bid for more. It's the same kind of process qualitatively that I've been, uh, that we've been talking about. Now, um, you can read about it, by the way, at um, the association uh, identified here, appic.org slash match. Uh, it's the same kind of, of process that we've been talking about. It didn't work very well. Why didn't it work very well? Well, and this is, again, one of the reasons I'm mentioning it to you. It had one of the same problems that the FCC auction has had. It takes too long. What goes on in this process, and this will sound familiar, this is a familiar problem with these ascending auctions, if you think about them for a while. After a while, the, uh, most of the people, remember, if you watch the FCC spectrum auctions, after usually well less than half of the auction, most of the licenses are in the hands of the person who's eventually going to win them. But the auction doesn't end, then it goes on and on beyond that as the, you know, maybe there's just a few more bids often in the final rounds. Well, this was going on and on after the um, most people were, had all, were already holding offers from the program that they were eventually going to accept. But what would happen is there's only one guy left to match. Let's say it's me. I'm still, uh, I'm still looking for somebody, and I make a call to Simon. And, and Simon says yes. Does that end the problem? Well, no, it doesn't, because Simon was, uh, was holding uh, an offer from you know, someone else. So Simon calls that other guy back and says, sorry but um, I don't need your offer anymore. Now, there's, uh, now it's maybe Pepper who's got a, uh, an empty position, and he calls someone. And we have this slow process where sort of a little bit at a time, the final details of the allocation are being worked out. Well, this might sound familiar to some of you. Okay? Um, this, is, this is, we see this all the time now in the simultaneous ascending auctions at the FCC. What did, what did the psychologists do to solve this problem? They introduced proxy bidding. So they introduced a system where what the bidders do or what the programs do is they create a rank order list of the students. And the students create a rank order list of the programs. And the process works exactly the same way I just described, except that it's completely automated so that time is not an issue. The, uh, uh, within, the, within the program, what happens is each, uh, each one of these people who is hoping for a residency, or for, uh, rather for an internship or a postdoc, makes an application to the preferred program. The program holds on to the best applications it's, it's received, rejects the rest. The computer moves down the list, says, oops, you got rejected from that one. What's your second choice? Makes the next offer. It's exactly the same process I just described, except that it's automated and runs in under a minute, of course. Right? It's just like that. Right? You can do this. Um, you can do this for the simultaneous ascending auction too. Uh, what you need for this to work well is you need to be able to say what your preferences are in advance. You know, the the reason for not completely automating a process, if we choose not to completely automate the simultaneous ascending auction, it would be because the bidders learn something useful during the process about prices and so on and. Uh, what might be attractive business plans and use that information. But even, when, if, you don't, even if you don't totally automate a process, you could partially automate it. And we've been discussing among ourselves here the, the uh, possibility of creating a partially automated system that would drastically reduce the amount of time that the auctions take on the one hand, while still allowing some of this processing that's so valuable to bidders. I hope I'm not boring you with all these examples, but they're all over the place, right? This is, um, you think there are too many? No. Oh, okay, all right, all right. So New York City schools, all right, this is 2003. I picked this one up out of the, out of the spring newspapers. Um, the newspaper doesn't provide me quite all the detail I wanted, unfortunately, but uh, apparently in 2003 there were an unusually large number of applicants. What was different in 2003 is there was an unusually large number of applicants to the New York City high schools. And by the way, all this information is from the New York Times, and so it reflects the level of detail I can give you <laughs> is limited by what's in the New York Times. Okay? So the, um, about 100,000 eighth graders, and I think that they said that last year it was only about 80,000. They didn't say why there were so many more. But about 100,000 eighth graders were applying to high schools, and um, and then they didn't give numbers about how many rejected, although I've learned from other sources that the number was in the hundreds, um, that several middle school principals were shocked to learn that dozens of their students had not been accepted by a single school. 
Okay? And then there was a scramble to try to uh, match the uh, students to schools. So the New York City School Commissioner, Joel Klein, has, um, uh, has hired Al Roth at, uh, at Harvard, and um, I've forgotten who else, but there's, uh, the, Al Roth was involved in designing the medical match and said, can you design a match for us that um, will match students to schools uh, in, in a way that works a little better than this? And indeed, the match design is a bidding design that works very much like the, um, uh, what I just described for the psychologists. Uh, this is the, the design that Roth is proposing to them. It's not adopted yet. But again, it's coming from the highest levels of the, of the school. And we expect something like that will be done. Again, it uses a proxy bidder. That is, the students list the, um, uh, their preferences. And by the way, details, let me just take a moment to talk about details here. One of the problems with a typical matching design, like what the uh, British medical match was based on, is uh, stu if students were subjected to a procedure like that, they'd have to worry about wasting a choice. There's this problem that you face that uh, you say, well, I'd really like to list uh, Brooklyn Tech High School first, but uh, I probably won't get in there. And if I, uh, you know, if I cross them off my list, I can rank somebody else number one and then have a better chance of getting into that school. You may have heard of this kind of problems with matching before. It's a problem with some matching algorithms. All of them that are based on priority schemes have a problem like this. The matching system that I've described to you does not have that problem. So let me uh, point out, since I have a little bit of time to talk about theory, let me, let me point out this, um, this match that I've described to you has the property that it's a dominant strategy for a student to report its ranking truthfully. What does that mean? That means there isn't any, any way that you could distort your ranking, put in something other than your truthful ranking, and end up at a school that you liked better uh, than the school you get when you report truthfully. Okay. That's a wonderful property when you think about it for a moment, right? The students don't have to say, gee, maybe I should give up on Brooklyn Tech because uh, I'm not too likely to get in. If Brooklyn Tech's their first choice, they just list it. There's no gaming in, in the system at all. Why is that? Well, if you think about it, and I'm just going to give you sort of a heuristic argument. The details actually are a little bit complicated. But the, heuristically, it works like this. The, um, suppose that I apply to Brooklyn Tech. They're my first choice and I don't really have a very good chance of getting in. Brooklyn Tech rejects me. What happens in the algorithm next? Well, uh, next I'm going to apply to high school X. All right? I apply to that high school. If they like me better than the person they've already got, they'll take me. They don't care whether I apply to them better at the first round or the second round or the third round. If they like me better than the guy they were being assigned, they'll knock that guy out and put me in. Okay? So this process auction-like process, if you will, leads to, um, well, the, the point I'm trying to make here is it leads to truthful reporting by the students. And once you have the students reporting truthfully, it also has other nice properties. It assigns uh, students according to their actual preferences. It, um, uh, I won't try to describe all of its properties here, actually. But it has a whole list of nice properties uh, if the students report truthfully. And it is in the student's interest to report truthfully in this, uh, in this algorithm. Okay. All right. Now, so far, um, I don't know how important you think the applications I've talked about are. And this, alas, is not something that's in the process of being done yet, although I hope it will be before long. There, um, so th there are a group of us working on market design issues. And, and one of the, uh, this is a recent paper this summer from a conference at Stanford where, where I teach. Um, this is about matching kidneys to humans. And it's also a bidding process, uh, the one I'm going to describe. In, in 2002, in the United States, there were 55,000 patients on the waiting list for kidneys. There were about 8,000 uh, transplants of cadaver kidneys. About 3,400 people died while they were waiting for kidney. Uh, about 900 more became too ill to qualify for transplantation. Uh, improving the kidney exchange is a matter of saving lives. Right? Um, matching a kidney to a recipient is uh, not a straightforward process. Um, there are uh, blood type issues. There are issues of certain antigens. The, uh, uh, the, the human 
one, one person might reject another person's kidney. There are issues of size and age. There are all sorts of issues that, that are relevant uh, to the exchange. So getting a good match between a, um, a donor and a, or, or between a kidney and a patient is, um, is a fairly complicated thing. And um, there are live donors out there. There are people, most, you only need one kidney, as I understand, and the, the, uh, 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 a number of people volunteer to donate a kidney for a relative who needs a kidney. Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes these are husband and wife uh, pairs, and often the husband and wife pairs are incompatible. Because the very, it turns out that uh, child pregnancy um, leads to the creation of antigens. You've, you introduce this foreign body into the woman's body. She develops certain, um, certain antigens to protect herself against it. That often makes uh, uh, transfers between husbands and wives infeasible. Okay, so the, the, um, uh, there have been some examples now of swaps where uh, uh, I'm willing to donate for my brother, uh, you're willing to donate for your sister. Um, turns out uh, I'm compatible with your sister and you're compatible with my brother. And we do a swap where we conduct these operations and use live kidneys, which are generally better than the cadaver kidneys, and, um, and create a match that improves the, um, you know, improves the situation. What we would like to do is we would like to make this possible to encourage um, uh, people to donate kidneys to the relatives to increase the supply of kidneys because we have a lot of people on the waiting list out there. Increasing the supply of kidneys would be a good thing, but we're not supposed to use money. It's been declared for, well, some of you may have seen there's a recent movie, what's it called? Um, Dirty Pretty Things, I think, out there is the movie. Uh, uh, when, when kidneys are bought, that's uh, bad news. The, the, uh, there's a lot of, well, a lot of unpleasantry associated with that, which I won't go into here. Um, in, in most states in the United States, it's illegal to uh, buy and sell organs. And, um, uh, pardon? No states, okay. And, and, I, and I understand also that, um, uh, well, it's been declared ethical by the, relevant, uh, by the relevant medical boards to do swaps without money. Okay, so uh, what can we do? Well, it turns out that there is a matching process that's very similar to the process I've described for you that identifies, um, that first of all, it makes you benefit from having, uh, from having a good kidney to swap. Uh, so if somebody donates, uh, a relative donates a valuable kidney, uh, that benefits the recipient whether or not you can use the kidney in this uh, kidney exchange. And it also assigns the kid kidneys efficiently in an appropriate sense. And I won't try to go through the, the technical details of that. But it assigns the kidneys efficiently in an appropriate sense and uh, saves lives, right? Encourages donations, saves lives. This is a big deal. And um, I'm hopeful that my colleagues who are working on this stuff will get their ideas um, accepted by the appropriate, uh, appropriate authorities so we can start seeing these things being being implemented, okay? Not implemented as yet. All right. Okay. Um, let's see, five to three. All right. Well, I want to tell you about. Uh, so I, I've talked about a lot of failures. By the way, that was classified under failures uh, because there isn't a kidney exchange. Right? Uh, we want there to be one, but there isn't one yet. New York City's classified as failures because last year. You know, we didn't get all the students assigned to high schools in an appropriate, uh, reasonable way, and so on. I've, each of these things that I've described to you was part of my many ways to fail talk. Uh, you fail to get a centralized process in, in, in uh, uh, going at all. You, you, you fail to allow uh, packages to be formed. Uh, you allow collusion to occur. Uh, you, uh, you have processes that are no longer being used at all because the, uh, they've led to unsatisfactory outcomes. You know, if you go down this list, it's, uh, uh, those all uh, qualify as failures. The, um, here are some uh, procedures that are continuing to be used um, and are even being mimicked. The, uh, the, my criterion for success, I selected these three because the National Resident Matching Program, the FCC zone, simultaneous multiple round auction, uh, the Electricity de France uh, power sales are being mimicked in other countries around the world. People, uh, they're successful enough, they're not unproblematic. You guys are, all know that uh, uh, the FCC has had its own problems with some of the spectrum auctions, but these guys 
are not only continuing to be used in each of the applications where they're listed, they're also being copied, sometimes with variations, uh, in other countries around the world. All right? National Resident Matching Program, um, basically, I've already described it to you, but I'll describe it again. Uh, the, the, uh, this, was, this program was redesigned in 1998, although the main features have been in existence for half a century now. The, the, the basic program was installed in 1950. Um, it matches about 20,000 doctors a year to hospital residency programs. Um, about 90% of all residency positions are filled this way. Uh, so that's say, I mean, this is voluntary participation. You don't have to use the uh, residency program. You can search for, uh, for a position outside uh, this, but nobody does. This has become the dominant way of uh, finding a residency. The, it, it works by the limited bidding procedure I've described to you. It's a proxy bidding procedure. You put down as a doctor your list of hospitals, rank, hospital programs ranked from first to last. In the procedure, you bid first. Your proxy bids on your behalf first for the hospital you would most like to be assigned to. And away we go. You, you guys know the, how the rest of the procedure goes. The hospitals hold on to their best offers, reject the rest. The rejected doctors move down the list. OK, so it's a, uh, uh, now this program worked very well for nearly half a century. Um, in fact, what I've described to you has been in existence since about 1950. Minor variations along the way. The, um, but it's been in existence since, uh, since about 1950. The, um, it is uh, facing some new challenges. And it, the new challenges are interesting in their own right because they're not dissimilar from some of the challenges that the FCC faces. One of the um, important uh, challenges is the growing importance of couples. In 1950, you know, there was typically a male doctor and his wife who followed him around. Um, in uh, 2003, it's not that way anymore. There are a lot of, and it's not just that there are women being followed by men, it's that there are couples, both of whom are doctors. And preferably, if they find a match, they'd at least like it to be in the same city. Um, they have to be matched as a pair. This uh, problem of, of matching couples has led to the introduction in the National Resident Matching Program of what might be called package bidding. That is, instead of just ranking the programs for the hospitals and, I'm sorry, programs for the uh, husband and programs for the wife, you now bid for pairs of programs. And you say, gee, uh, my first choice is to have, uh, you know, the, uh, Dr. A go to uh, Johns Hopkins and doc Dr. B go to whatever else is there. I'm sorry, I don't know the hospitals around there. But the, uh, the, you bid for pairs of hospitals, okay? Because you, you know, it's not any use to you to be, uh, to be assigned to hospitals individually. This sounds a lot like the problems we have here you know, when we talk about uh, business plans, where it's just no use to you to have an individual license. You need a certain collection of licenses for, uh, for that stuff to be valuable. Okay? So package bidding with proxies is used without prices, however, uh, in the National Resident Matching Program since 1998. Um, there are other issues which you might also be interested in. The, the, uh, you may have noticed uh, there is a lawsuit going on now. The, some residents have, um, have sued the match, um, uh, alleging that it's a device by which hospitals collude over uh, wages and working conditions. Um, there's really no opportunity to get a job outside the match. You can't get a hospital to increase its offer if you're a good student and so on. So there are a number of issues that are involved, and it's really quite interesting. I've had an opportunity to talk to some of the lawyers involved in these cases that what they're talking about replacing it with is a simultaneous ascending auction, right? Basically, the, the, they're talking about allowing the hospitals as part of the match or, and the students as part of the match to, to vary the prices. So it's a, very much the same kind of, uh, of procedure, but one in which in which wages or working conditions are also, uh, are also determined. So um, this is one of the things that's helped convince me that we really can't treat these things as separate topics anymore. The, the, um, uh, if you're going to allow price competition in connection with a match, you have to do something like what the FCC is doing. Okay. Well, I don't know how much I need to say about uh, this here. The, the flattery, is, flattery is very sincere. Um, 
you know, the, the, uh, except for Antarctica, there are, um, there are examples of simultaneous ascending auctions now on every continent. Um, the, uh, we can take a look at some objective indicators. Now, I, again, I don't want to whitewash the, the uh, problems that exist with every known mechanism. Participation levels, the uh, price arbitrage across similar licenses, uh, the uh, speculation, immediate resale of licenses, that's a bad thing. We, we, uh, we don't like to see much of it, and we haven't seen as much um, of it at the FCC as we've seen in some other auction sales. Uh, the mere fact that the highest bidder wins, which might sound like a strange thing to include on the list, but when I show you some examples, you'll see that even just having the highest bidder win is, uh, is an advantage compared to some auctions. Um, challenges for the future, you know, you guys know about. Uh, these are the challenges we're working on that, you know, the people here, uh, I hope to also be helping with uh, work on now concern uh, solving these, the exposure problem, allowing a bidder to bid for what he wants. Uh, uh, by implementing package bidding and dealing with, you know, in a practical way. And these are, these are problems, those of you who are working on it know that these are hard problems and, and uh, the, the design issues are not trivial. Now, um, some old examples. Um, first of all, the first example is the, uh, the arbitrage. Arbitrage does not always occur in all auctions. In old auctions, uh, the old designs, some of the designs that had competed with the simultaneous multiple round auction when we were first working on this was just sell the you know, items like Sotheby's might one at a time in sequence. Why don't we do that? Why, why did the FCC decide not to do that? Well, this was one of the examples that was cited back in the old days. Um, uh, this was a sale, the, as far as I know, this was the first Spectrum auction. Um, Sotheby's uh, was selling RCA's uh, rights to use an RCA communication satellite. There were seven identical transponders on the satellite. Um, they were sold in an ascending oral outcry auction uh, at Sotheby's in New York. The first one went for a price of $14.4 million. The second one for fourteen point one, the 13, 13.7, and so on down the list. Um, we got a pattern that uh, no two licenses sold for the same price. There was uh, you know, something like a 35% difference between the lowest price and, and, the, uh, and the highest price. And uh, some of you may remember that the commission overturned this sale on the grounds of price discrimination. Uh, so the, the um, I don't know whether that makes any sense to, uh, to the economists, it doesn't make any sense. But anyway, the, uh, uh, you don't automatically get arbitrage that is similar things being sold at similar prices in old fashioned auctions. The simultaneous multiple round auction at the FCC did succeed in getting um, uniform pricing uh, for similar items. Oops, I'm supposed to go here. Um, it's another one. John McMillan, who was a consultant to the FCC back in early design, likes to emphasize the New Zealand's uh, uh, early spectrum auction. They had uh, employed some uh, consultants who told them that Vickery's second price auction idea was a wonderful idea, which it is in the right applications, uh, but is not in the way it was impl implemented in New Zealand. Okay, and uh, what they did is they had seven identical, again, seven seems to be the magic number, um, seven identical uh, licenses that were being sold using a second price auction. Um, if you're a bidder and you want three of them, which three should you bid for? This was a simultaneous sealed bid auction. You write down a number for each of uh, the seven. You write down a number, you know, this is how much I'm bidding for number one, and this is how much I'm bidding for number three, and this is how much, they're all, all the same, but you put in as many bids as you want. Well, you don't know what to bid for. This is a stupid design, right? Uh, nobody knows what to bid for. So, and, and not only that, we're gonna sell it for the second highest bid. So what happened? So Sky over here, as you can see, put in a slightly higher bid for one than it did for two and three. These look like they used a random number generator or something. I don't know. Um, and uh, the second highest bid was 401,000. The winning bid was 2.273 million New Zealand dollars. And um, the press was in an uproar over this. They said, wait a minute, somebody's offered 2.3 million and we're selling it for 400,000. How come? You know, this was... Uh, not popular in the, uh, in the public. And we have some price variation. These are, remember, these are identical licenses. They range in price from 100,000 to 400,000. There's a four to one price variation. Um, 
in these, uh, in these things. There's no sense from looking at this that the license assignment was necessarily efficient, that the, highest, that the guys who bid the most always win. Um, you know, they're, here's a you know, 401,000 bid sometimes loses and sometimes wins. Here's a $255,000 bid that wins. You know, the highest bid doesn't even always win in this auction. I mean, you know, come on. This is uh, this horrible design with the help of a high-priced consultant. Um, so having your, having your own you know, expert staff in-house uh, has definitely been of some value at the FCC, I think. Now, this is in contrast. Uh, this is when we, I remember jumping up and celebrating the result of the first spectrum auction. This is number one at the FCC when all of us were holding our breath, wondering if the software was going to work and, uh, and all that. <laughs> I see some smiles out there. We all remember this, those of us who were there. The uh, auction number one, you know, we wanted, what we're looking for uh, was arbitrage, right, that identical licenses should sell for similar prices. Boy, we got $80 million identical prices on the first five licenses. The next three, which are also very similar, we get nearly identical prices. The, you know, the biggest difference, you know, there's a million dollar difference, three, three per, less than 3% difference. That's the biggest difference we find among the identical licenses in that opening auction. We were just ecstatic with this, uh, this outcome, even though the press only looked at this number. Um, but, the, uh, but those of us who were watching this looked at the rationality in terms of um, not only the, the arbitrage, but the relationship between the prices and how much spectrum in total was being offered. And we found that that relationship made sense. The, uh, there were lots of economic indications that we were getting reasonable economic outcomes in this auction, as we hoped, uh, as we hoped the design would do. Okay, so that was, uh, and the FCC is, you know, I, I, I'm not going to go over all the pluses and minuses and ups and downs, but the FCC has done well enough to be imitated around the world. Um, so my colleague, two of my colleagues who aren't here today, uh, Larry Ozabel and Peter Crampton, um, are now in the process of running their ninth auction for Electricity de France. Um, I think it's, the mock auction was yesterday, and I think, I think the, anyway, the, the, the ninth uh, power auction in France is taking place this week. And this one is also now starting to be imitated uh, in several other countries. Belgium has just announced that they're going to run an identical auction to this. And uh, there are several other similar ones, uh, similar ones around the world. Belgians is identical to what I'm going to describe. Um, so uh, they were required by regulatory authorities to divest uh, power generation capacity, and uh, the uh, EDF to, to meet that requirement, uh, they divest what they call these are really contracts, what they call virtual power plants and power purchase agreements. So this is the right to take up to. Uh, some amount of power at a particular price over a particular period of time. There are two kinds of contracts. There's the, the nuclear ones, which are base load power, and there's the gas turbine ones, which is uh, peak load power. Um, there are con separate contracts for those different kinds of power. Um, the contracts are for different lengths of term. The uh, a virtual power plant for, let's say, base load power can be for 3, 6, 10, 12, or 24, or now, actually, now they include 36 months. Um, so you can have uh, contracts anywhere from three months to 36 months. And the, um, the twist, there's a, several twists compared to the FCC. One of the twists is that the seller is constrained by its three-month capacity. Um, that is, if, if I sell a certain amount of three, six, 10, and 12-month contracts, what constrains me is that I only have so much power generation capacity in the first three months. Other than that, I can substitute among them. I can take you know, uh, 10 megawatts of three-month power and still 10 megawatts of six-month power instead. It still won't violate any of my capacity constraints. Okay? The capacity constraints are always on the shortest, uh, the shortest term. Um, and here you can see how it works. If you have 200 megawatts of base load power to sell virtual power plants uh, for the first auction, which was uh, January 102, or I'm not sure if this was the first, but January 102 auction. Um, 200 megawatts for sale, if you sell various uh, quantities of contracts of different lengths, all that matters is that the total does not exceed uh, 200 megawatts. Okay. So how was the EDF auction designed? Well, uh, the design was that the seller specifies fixed price differences for contracts of different durations. For example, 
it might specify that a three-month contract will cost uh, 2,139 euros more per, per megawatt month than a six-month contract. It specifies that in advance. Okay? That's the uh, seller's specification. And then it runs what we call a clock auction. Um, what happens in the clock auction is that we have clocks, if you want, that are digital clocks that show the current price for each product. And those clocks showing the price for each product are all rising with a fixed difference between them. Okay? And um, what you get to do as a bidder is you get to say how much of each kind of contract you want at that list of prices. Uh, so long as the total demand exceeds the total available supply, the clock continues to move up. Okay? There's an activity rule uh, that says that you can't introduce new demand as the prices go up. Um, the auction ends for all products simultaneously um, at the time when the total demand is just equal to the three-month three capacity. Okay? So this is actually um, an evolution of the FCC's original simultaneous ascending auction design. Notice that, like all the processes I've been describing, so these are processes that have ascending prices for all the products. All the prices are going up. It has activity rules to ensure that there is uh, some serious bidding at the beginning to help the price discovery process. All bidding ends at once. We don't end the bidding on different products at different times. So those are uh, properties that are in common between the EDF and the FCC. But EDF exploits some things that are different about its environment. Um, it has a simple classification of contracts. So instead of having people say, well, here's three contracts that are identical, bid on whichever one you want, it says, just tell me how many of this kind of contract you want. I'm not, I, I don't need you to tell me which of them you want. They're, they're all the same. Okay, so, so when you have homogeneity, you can exploit that in the design. In complicated designs, when you're selling a lot of things, that can be a, an enormous simplification. And we've explored some of that, too, in, in, um, in the uh, if spectrum is spectrum, uh, you might be able to uh, exploit the same kind of, uh, of, of simplification in designing a spectrum auction. It enforces the arbitrage is automatic here. Each kind of contract has only one price. Everybody pays the same price for a contract of a given kind. Um, the overall capacity constraint only is different from the FCC's. The FCC is, has things now where there's a separate constraint for each product. Uh, the use of clock, and by the way, I didn't say before, this is run with proxy bidders. Um, it's run in multiple stages with typically four stages with proxy bidders where the uh, bidders state their uh, relative values and the uh, proxy bidders bid on their behalf until the price has risen a certain amount. And um, then the bidders get to revise uh, their proxies and the, uh, it runs again. And it runs in four stages that way, uh, facilitating price discovery and allowing some flexibility to the bidders. Uh, so we have uh, a, a proxy auction, which accelerates the thing, uh, um, clocks, which also help accelerate the, uh, the entire process. The whole thing runs in uh, part of a day and um, you know, in an afternoon, for example, and sells a very large fraction of France's electrical generating capacity. Okay? So it, uh, again, has many of the same design elements. Well, at least these three that I've indicated are shared by EDF and FCC. Um, this is uh, something that's pretty much standard now in, in all, the, all modern auction designs. Um, pretty much this, uh, those design elements, and, uh, and in addition, some tailoring that fits it well to its own context. Okay. Um, I've tried during the course of this, um, of this discussion to uh, already hint at most of the theory. So my theory slides are mostly wrap-ups. I, I don't intend to uh, take you in any depth into uh, uh, what researchers are saying. I do want to give you uh, the idea that there's quite a variety in the research that's going on out there. There are three kinds of research uh, that are going on, empirical, theoretical, and experimental. The empirical researchers are looking out there to see which kinds of markets in the real world actually thrive and grow. Can we identify why? Can we identify the characteristics that, uh, that characterize the markets that have succeeded? For example, in the British matching market, We've seen that the bidding processes have survived, 
and the priority matching processes have not survived. Okay, that's uh, useful information to know when you're thinking about designing either an auction or a matching processes. Um, then there are also questions about whether the theories, uh, how well the theories fit the data. Do the bidders behave qualitatively as predicted? We typically in empirical research can't, uh, uh, can't say a lot about whether they behave quantitatively as expected. That there's a, well, we can say something about that, but there's uh, uh, limits on our ability with empirical data to tease apart the motives of the bidders. There are theoretical um, research that continues to go on. Um, I most, most of my research is in the theoretical vein, although I'm also down here a little bit. Um, what are the properties of various alternative designs? How do we expect them to perform? And then, given our theories, can we design markets that will per market designs? Can we design rules that will perform well for the problem at hand? Uh, that's what the theorists are engaged in. And then we have the experimenters, um, including a recent Nobel laureate as uh, Vernon Smith, but also Charlie Plott at, at MIT and John Cagle at Ohio State and a number of others, including uh, colleagues of mine who are starting, to, starting up at, North, at uh, Stanford, um, where, we're, where we can control the value. We can see a lot more than we can in the empirical data. We can ask, uh, uh, you know, you can't ask uh, of the empirical data for bidders whose value is a million dollars, how much do they bid, because you don't get to see the values. But in a laboratory experiment, you can do that. You can say for bidders whose values are $10, how much do they bid? Because you can, you can make their value $10 by rewarding them $10 uh, for winning an object. Okay, so we can, we can run some small-scale experiments in the lab, um, ask uh, whether the theories hold up, what problems we run into in implementation, are, are the differences among designs significant when we're comparing alternative designs? Are we getting a big improvement by going to package bidding? When are we getting the big improvement? For what kinds of environments is it important and when isn't it? Um, and then when we find designs that seem to, uh, to perform well, the experimenters are not limited by the, um, uh, by the theories. They push on, based on their own intuitions, trying alternatives that, uh, that seem to uh, you know, that seem to address the problems they're finding in the lab and generating their own hypotheses, which then feeds back to what uh, people like me spend our time thinking about. We see something that seems to work very well in the lab and try to understand why and whether we can uh, uh, find design principles that will let us uh, design better auctions. So those three kinds of research are going on. Um, just to say a few last words about how these relate to the FCC, um, multi-round auctions, the, these sort of one-round prior, priority scheme-like auctions that I described for matching, one-round auctions for the most part, um, when you have a variety of heterogeneous uh, items, um, most such designs do not perform well. In complex settings, the, uh, the auction appears to require a multi-round design. Um, that's one of the things that's, uh, that seems to be coming out of all the kinds of research that we're talking about. Exchanges, which is uh, something that Evan has been very interested in. Um, seller market power in an exchange can be a barrier to efficiency. Uh, in, in the spectrum, that can be a big problem because the, the, there's a lot of local market power. You have the only, uh, if, if you need adjacent bands of spectrum and somebody has a band here and you own the band there, you're the only one who owns adjacent spectrum that creates seller market power. Those kinds of things are, are a, an important barrier to creating an effective exchange. Uh, we, we, uh, you, you can't solve this just by an auction design. You actually have to solve the problem of seller market power to make this work well. Um, complementarities, where pieces of spectrum are used together in fixed ways, tend to contribute to seller market power. Um, and uh, we saw those of us involved in uh, the spectrum exchange that was uh, supposed to go with auction 31, the, the, um, uh, that it's important to design ways to limit the power of holdouts, uh, to limit the power of individuals to block reallocation of spectrum, um, or to block efficient new uses of spectrum. Otherwise, it's very hard to design a market-based mechanism. Um, Proxy bidding, we're, we're seeing it in uh, a variety of processes. We see it in the EDF auction. We see it in various matching processes. It does speed the market clearing pro uh, process. I mentioned doctors and psychologists. Uh, I should add EDF here. Uh, proxy bidding 
in theory, eliminates the possibility of collusion in the auction. People can always collude outside an auction, but the uh, proxy bidding eliminates certain kinds of strategies that involve retaliation. They become impossible. And the, in fact, one can demonstrate, as a matter of theory, that there aren't any strategies that remain that are sufficient to uh, support collusion. Um, and it helps to promote um, efficient outcomes. And again, the, this. Uh, uh, there's a technical term here, uh, core outcomes. I'm not going to describe that here, but this, uh, this is not only efficient, but it also involves the substantial revenues for the seller. Sometimes colluders can uh, do things that allocate the, and assign the spectrum efficiency, efficiently and leave no money for the FCC. Uh, it helps to promote core outcomes, which are outcomes that are uh, both efficient and provide um, uh, an ample revenue, a competitive revenue for the seller. And that's what I got. Do we take questions, or how do we do this? People pay a price that they later decide is too high. Uh, 3G in Europe uh, is that a is that independent of auction design or is that a failed auction? No, I think that that was. Not, I don't believe that that was a failed auction. I'm I'm of the school that uh, you know during the uh, the technology bubble uh, there were people who overvalued some things. They paid too much for a lot of things. A lot of people paid too much for stocks they bought on the NASDAQ. Uh, a lot of people paid too much for, uh, for radio spectrum. Uh, that's not about the auction design. That was about the technology bubble. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't see it. What, uh, what? Oh, the terrorist exchange. That's what you're saying. Ah, the terrorist exchange. Um, you know, <laughs> can I do this safely here, Evan? I don't know what the uh, Evan told me to avoid. <laughs> Evan told me to avoid uh, uh, avoid stepping too far out. Um, well, I think that most of the arguments that were raised on both sides of that debate were silly. Um, and I think that the uh, the chance that, for example, somebody could profit by benefit, you know, by making a hundred dollar bet that the uh, that, you know some terrorist. And remember, these were very small amounts. I mean, you know, that's ridiculous. And, and particularly if the you know somebody's going to pay that person, the identities are going to be kept. Am I going to, you know, uh, try to win a hundred dollars so that you know leave my name on the record because I'm planning? You know, this is, that was just ridiculous. Uh, but on the other hand, I also think that uh, in that particular application, the idea that there would be you know, a lot of individuals who would have inside information, dispersed inside information about you know, uh, terrorist activities that was likely to happen and would thereby reveal it to the government, that also struck me as a little bit crazy. Uh, the, the, my, my gut reaction was that both sides of that argument were being silly. That was my gut reaction. Quickly, uh, do you think that the fact that they used a uniform price auction in California and the electricity uh, markets played a role in uh, the failure of the mechanism? Um, I do not think that that was a primary consideration in the, um, in the failure in California. Um, you know, the, the theory on this in that area is unsettled, I would say. So we, we, we don't have, uh, uh, but, but I find the theories that, uh, that list that as primary uh, implausible. Uh, so, you know, I think some experimentation would be helpful in, in finding out a firm answer to that question. Uh, but there were, other, there were other clear errors in the design. And there were, you know, the, the biggest errors are, you know, again, they, uh, the, the matching of, of uh, long-term commitments to, to uh, buyers with short-term procurement, that was just dumb. The, and by the way, California is doing something dumb again. They decided they learned the lesson from that, 
And so now, uh, California utilities are required to buy 95% of their electricity long term, right? They did a complete reversal on the, uh, in the rules in California. I mean, it's just, anyway. The, uh, so the, the, uh, the matching, the matching of, of demand and supply, the, the, uh, the very bad luck they had with weather and, and, um, and other shortfalls, the, the hot weather, the low rainfall, which reduced the capacity coming out of the Northwest. Um, the you know absolutely ridiculous things where they have a day ahead market that doesn't respect transmission constraints. I mean, you know the the, the, uh, the uniform price auction rule is uh, in, in that list is way down somewhere if if it's a problem at all. I, I hope this won't cause you to violate not going too far out. Um, but do you have any thoughts on? where we might want to think about or look to in our withdrawal default or collusion rules on anything that you've seen or looked at in you know, the many, many auctions to date? Yeah. Um, so the, that's a subject that I haven't visited in the last few years, actually. I, I, I had taken a position on that a few years back. Um, and I think I'm a little too out of date to, to do that. I think that the biggest thing to say about it is that uh, the main legitimate reason for withdrawals, I mean, you know, I, I was opposed to uh, loose withdrawal rules from the very beginning. Um, I've always come out against them in the past uh, because of the strategic ability to use them. They could be used in a, a whole variety of strategic uh, uh, the ways that you could use them that are destructive. Uh, the main reason to be allowed to use them is uh, where you see significant complementarities. And the way we ought to be solving that is by having a kind of package auction design that lets people bid for what they want. The, the withdrawal rules were always sort of a, uh, a Band-Aid, and they were a Band-Aid with, uh, they were a dirty Band-Aid, if you know what I mean. Uh, they, uh, they carried bacteria on them that infected the process, I thought. I like that.